Hey guys, Trevor Sullivan here, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me. And one of the other topics that I wanted to talk about on this channel, and I'm planning on adding a lot more in the future, are open source software packages that I personally find useful. Now, open source software is really powerful. It's great to have community support behind software. And also, a lot of open source software is cross-platform. Actually, that goes for a lot of software in general these days. And so when you're working with various software packages, it's nice to be able to switch between Windows, Linux, Mac OS, as I often do. I kind of switch between these different operating systems. And it's nice to be able to keep all of the data that I have in various applications and the same user experience across different operating systems. So that leads us to this software package known as Joplin. And I've been using Joplin for probably close to a year, maybe even potentially a little bit over a year at this point. And this is simply a note-taking application. Now there's a lot of different open source note taking applications out there, but I ended up just deciding on Joplin and I'm really actually happy with it and I plan to continue using it for the foreseeable future. One of the things that I really like about Joplin is that it is a desktop application here. There's also support for mobile apps as well. And one of the things I like about Joplin is the fact that your data can be synchronized between different systems. By default, when you install Joplin and you start taking notes inside of this utility, it is only going to store your data locally, but it does have support to synchronize your notebooks with a variety of different storage providers. Now, Joplin is open source, and you can find the application over here on GitHub under the user Laurent22 slash Joplin. And as you can see, it's a pretty popular application. It's got over 36,000 stars on GitHub. As all things considered, that's a pretty large number of stars. So it is a very popular application. And as you can see, it works on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS. So all of these different devices, whether you're using an Android tablet like I do, an Android phone, a Mac OS system, a Linux virtual machine, uh, maybe you're using Linux natively on your desktop application on bare metal, whatever it may be, then you can install Joplin and synchronize your notes. So I really like it for that reason. I typically install it using the Scoop Package Manager, which is a package manager for Windows. And this is just a really easy way to install Joplin along with many other utilities here. So feel free to use Scoop to install your different dev tools, Joplin, as well as many others. So what you typically do is install Joplin and then you fire it up and then you figure out, you know, where do I want to synchronize my notes to? So let's go ahead and fire up Joplin right here. And I've got a brand new Joplin environment. You can do that by creating what's known as a profile. So over in the file menu, you can go to switch profile and there's a default profile that gets created when you install Joplin, but you can create additional profiles as well. So you can seamlessly switch between maybe a home environment, a work environment and whatever else. So the ability to use profiles to set up different notebooks, different data sets with different synchronization settings is really handy, especially if you have a separate home and work environment to work inside of. When you start up Joplin, you'll have a sample notebook created here, but because I've created an empty profile here, we don't have any data. So I'm gonna go ahead and just create a new notebook here called Trevor Sullivan. You can also use emojis in the name. So if you want to, you could use maybe like a little rocket there. Uh, I use emojis just to help me kind of quickly visually identify different notebooks inside of my Joplin environment here. Also, you might notice that if you install Joplin, the layout of the application by default is gonna look a little bit different. And so what you can actually do is modify the application layout right here under the view menu. By default, the list of notes is actually gonna be in its own separate vertical window right here. And so your default environment is probably gonna look something like this, where you have your notebooks on the left, the notes inside of each notebook on the middle section here. And then when you create a note, you'll actually have a text editor for writing your markdown text along with the actual rendered markdown. 
Now you can create a whole bunch of notebooks here. So maybe you want to create a work notebook. So I'll create a work notebook right here. You can also create child notebooks. So I'll do something like, you know, June 2023 notes, and then I could put all of my June notes inside of here. It's really entirely up to you how you want to structure your data. You'll have to come up with some kind of format that works for you. Uh, but what we can do then is inside of one of these notebooks, just create a new note. And each note is really simple. It just has a title along with some text. And again, it uses Markdown as the text rendering engine here. So we have support for creating things like lists. Uh, so maybe I could create a list of items like item one, item two, item three. I'm not feeling super creative right now. So we can just use asterisks for that. Also, if we want to embed some code samples right here, we can do that. Uh, maybe I want to specify the PowerShell language here. I think it supports syntax highlighting for these different languages. As you can see, we are getting some nice syntax highlighting right here for PowerShell. But if I was to change it to something else like maybe Rust, for example, you'll see that that breaks syntax highlighting there because it's using a different language. All right, so that's support for some basic markdown things here. Also, if we want to do bold text, we can do Control-B add a couple of asterisks around our text. And as you can see, that creates bold text. We also have support for headings. So we can do, you know, heading one, we can do a double hash sign here for heading two, and so on and so forth. And so that gives us a nice way to create some structure inside of our markdown documents. Now, I don't really use these as much as just regular notes, but you can create these to-do items as well. And then you can create these little checkboxes to kind of check off that your to-do list has been completed. I don't really tend to use that feature, but that is an alternative type of note that you can create inside of your Joplin notebooks. Now, one of my favorite features about Joplin is the ability to do data synchronization here. If we head over to the options section right here, you can see that there's support for a, lang a number of different languages. There's a number of different date formats that we can use here. I always think that this one is correct because it starts with the largest time, which is the year, then it goes to month, then it goes to day, and so on and so forth. You can also set up external text editors if you want to edit your markdown in separate editors. But then if we go down to synchronization here, this is where we can set up data synchronization for our Joplin notebooks across different systems. Now, I like to use the S3 provider here because S3 providers or S3 data is really a common API across many different storage providers. So if you go set up S3 as a backend synchronization target right here, it does say it's in beta, but I've been using it for quite some time and it works really great. You can specify your S3 bucket right here, your S3 URL, your region, your access key, and your secret key. And then you can set up the interval that you want to synchronize your data to your backend provider with down here. And so this is a really great way to set up synchronization. Now you might be asking, well, who should I use for S3 backend storage? Can I use Amazon Web Services, S3? Can I use any other providers out there? And the answer is yes, you can use Amazon S3 storage directly, or you can use other S3 compatible providers. Some of my favorites are things like Backblaze B2 Cloud Storage. I believe they actually provide a 10 gigabyte free tier as well. So if you want to get started with S3 storage, but you don't want to necessarily shell out the few pennies that it will cost you to use S3 storage, then you can start with B2 Cloud Storage. Also, another S3 compatible provider is Filebase, and they provide, again, S3 compatible storage on the blockchain. And so they actually have a free tier that supports five gigabytes of storage, and they do have pretty minimal data transfer fees as well. So this is another great provider if you're looking to start with S3, but you don't wanna shell out the cash that Amazon S3 costs. Now, some of my other favorite providers are things like Akami, Akamai Linode here. They do provide S3 compatible storage, but unfortunately, I don't believe they provide a free tier and their pricing for S3 storage actually starts at $5 per month. Uh, same thing with DigitalOcean. They actually have S3 compatible uh, object storage spaces as well. And I believe they have a minimal cost of something like $5 as well. So if you're looking to start with S3 storage, then you're probably going to be looking at something like Filebase or B2 cloud storage. Also, Wasabi is another provider out there. I'm not sure if they have a free tier, but feel free to search around if you want to use something besides B2 or Filebase storage. 
Also, you could use Azure Blob Storage, and they actually support this open source project called an S3 proxy. So you can use the S3 compatible APIs with various backend providers like Microsoft Azure Blob Storage, which isn't S3 compatible natively, but by using this S3 proxy, which you actually have to run separately, then you can actually make Microsoft Azure Storage compatible with the S3 APIs. That's just something that I came across this morning and I actually thought was pretty interesting because uh, it kind of transforms a Azure Blob Storage into an S3 compatible API. So I'm gonna go ahead and just use B2 Cloud Storage here in order to set up a test environment to show you how the data synchronization works. Now, if you have a Backblaze account, you could just go into the B2 Storage Console and you create a new bucket here. Buckets that were created before a certain date, I don't remember exactly what date that is, but they are not compatible with S3. So my bucket down here was created before they had S3 compatible endpoints. And so you'll see that my endpoint down here is actually empty. But if you create a newer bucket, then you can see that it does have an S3 compatible endpoint down here. That'll give you the DNS name for it. And then you can create these application keys down here in order to authenticate to your buckets. So let me get signed back in. We'll go down to the application keys right here and we'll say add a new app key. And then right here, we'll just give it a key like Joplin and I'll say you only have access to this particular bucket. Of course, we need to make sure that we have read and write access to that bucket so that Joplin can store data inside of there. And then for our prefix here, we're just gonna leave that empty because we'll just store it at the root. And we also have the ability to set a duration for validity of these keys. And it's a good idea to rotate your keys periodically, but for now, I'll just leave that empty. All right, so now we have our key ID and our application key, which is our access key ID and our access uh, secret key, our S3 secret key down here. So what we want to do is plug in our S3 bucket, which is Trevor S3. We also want to plug in our S3 URL. So let's go back over to buckets right here, and we'll grab our S3 endpoint right here and paste that in. We'll set our S3 region to, I think it's going to be US East 1 for the service here. And then we're going to paste in our access key ID and our secret key. Let me make sure I grab the right value from my clipboard. And then I've noticed that you actually have to use path style here in order to work correctly. Now, once you've set up all these parameters for Backblaze object storage, which again is S3 compatible, we'll just click on check synchronization configuration. And as you can see, that is successful. So now we can synchronize our notes with Backblaze. All right, so let's head back here. And on the bottom left, you can see that it is currently synchronizing my notes with Backblaze. And it's going to do that pretty quickly here. It's usually faster once it's done an initial synchronization. And there you go. After just 12 seconds, we are synchronized. So now if we add a new note, like work log, and say here are the things I finished today, We'll just do a control S. That's a nice keyboard shortcut that will do a synchronization and Joplin will just automatically store that new note up in object storage. If we head back over to the console here for whatever S3 provider you're using, you can just go over to browse files. Then I'll go into my Trevor S3 bucket right here. And as you can see, I've got all these files pertaining to my Joplin notebook here. And so anytime that I go to a new system, I can just set up my synchronization and it'll download all of these items from my central object storage. So this is one of my favorite things about Joplin is that we can centralize centralize our data storage using S3 compatible storage. In fact, I don't even use cloud storage. Technically, I am using a self-hosted instance of Minio, and Minio is an, an open source object storage solution. So you can actually run your own instance of Minio on your own hardware, and it is S3 compatible. So this is the perfect way to keep your data private. You don't have to store it on any cloud provider, and it's entirely within your control. So I would encourage you, if you're very privacy centric, to use Minio and just self-host that instead of using a centralized cloud provider.
However, if you do need to use a centralized cloud provider like Backblaze, then you can also encrypt your data. So if we come back to our options right here, we actually have the ability to go down to encryption right here. We can enable encryption, and then we can plug in a password like Trevor123, and that is going to force a resynchronization of all of our data. So down here, you can see we've added our new encryption key, and it's going to resynchronize all of our data after it encrypts it locally. So that way, all of the data is encrypted first on your local workstation, and then the data is going to be stored in the cloud provider. And that gives you the maximum privacy and security from any peeping eyes of your cloud storage account in case maybe the government decides to you know, grab a copy of your data using a warrant or something like that. You can make sure that you keep your data private it from any prying eyes. So that's just another awesome feature of using Joplin here. If you do decide that cloud storage just isn't for you, but you still need some way to synchronize your data between systems, then you can either use one of the other supported data providers here, like maybe Dropbox or maybe um, just the local file system. But what we can do in our Joplin environment here is actually go to export all, and we can generate this JEX file, Joplin export file, and you can directly import this. And I actually just did this recently when I was migrating some data between disks. And this actually works really well. We can just export the entire notebook into a separate file. We can copy that file to a system. You could send yourself a file on something like Telegram or just use some kind of file sharing mechanism and then re-import that file using the import function here as well. Now, for now, the last feature I wanted to talk about is the excellent support for keyboard shortcuts. So once you start building up a huge notebook here, you're going to want to be able to jump between different notes. So maybe I have like a Trevor note over here in my Trevor Sullivan notebook, but under my work log here, I've got a couple of different items. So if I want to jump over to the note in my Trevor Sullivan notebook, I can hit control P and then I can just do a quick search on the text inside of that note and I can jump directly to it. This is really similar to VS Code where you can just hit control P and do a search for a file inside of your VS Code environment. So it does really feel at home for anybody who's familiar with that type of tool. Also, if you do control shift P, there is support for a command palette, which I think every application out there should have because a command palette gives you a central location to search for pretty much any function in the application. So if you want to run a synchronization, but you forget the shortcut for it, like control S, then you can just do control shift P, search for synchronize and run that operation really quickly. Also, you can customize your keyboard shortcuts. So if you go over to tools and then options and go down to keyboard shortcuts right here, you can see all of the default shortcuts here, but you can also edit these shortcuts and assign a custom shortcut to any of these operations inside of Joplin. So I'd strongly encourage you to check out Joplin, install Joplin, feel free to try it out and see if it works for you. Or if it doesn't work for you, then feel free to try out one of the many other note-taking solutions out there in the open source marketplace. I am an independently supported channel here, so please like this video, subscribe to the channel, share a link to this video with your friends, and keep an eye out for new videos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.